Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, hello, 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 and welcome back to Heine House Live Gaming and Tech Podcast. I'm your good friend Jason, hanging out with you. We're doing the early morning edition, or late night, depending on wherever you are in the world. It's currently 7.05, exactly, on the dot here in the morning. I've been up all night. My sleep schedule is still screwed up. I think it will continue to be screwed up for <laughs> forever, it feels like. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm up. My mind is running wild. I can't sleep. I try to get comfortable, can't get comfortable, can't sleep. And then I, then about midday, it hits me and I sleep and I, I go and I stream at night, you know, and I do that and hang out and play games. And then, you know, it's like being in quarantine. Definitely. It's, it's a different experience, right? You know, when you're kind of on lockdown, but mostly it's just my mind won't shut off and I uh, won't stop moving internally so it uh it trips me out but uh yeah i put all the notes together i went through steph had a whole bunch of great notes i put together a list of some stuff to talk about in the show today uh it's a great episode i've got we've got voicemails to go through at the end i think we got about three voicemails which is great um you see behind me i have the game boy out it's the, the game boy celebrated its birthday round of applause the old game boy where's my soundboard there we are hello it's waking up too talk about some of the games I have here, some of my favorite games on the console. Um, and I think uh, Alice actually sent over a, uh, a voicemail specifically talking about Game Boy games. So we will we'll jump into that too later on. A lot of great stuff. Um, yeah, so let's start the show. Thank you so much. Oh, hello. There we are. Hello, patrons. Thank you so much for your support, folks. Again, the show would not be possible without you all. And I appreciate you so, so much. Ground floor, main floor, the game lofters up there. Thank you all so much for your support. Patreon.com slash Jason Heine is where you go take part. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I offer my my music. I offer great perks in Discord and uh, on Twitch. And everywhere you go, there's lots of great stuff that it all interconnects. So it's it's a... It's a great, it's a great thing. And I'm very thankful to have support on there uh, for people to support and reach out and uh, show love to the creators they like. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Let's jump right into the show. We've got, uh, there's some stuff to talk about. Uh, under some random news here, I, I have some stuff I want to talk about related to Heine House, which is really, really great. This is exciting. Something I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Went through a rebrand. Um, it's a multi-step process. Um, went through some changes, some rebrands, did a, did a new logo, and then now I have even kind of condensed and rebranded. Not necessarily rebranded, but I've updated, more or less, more, the logo and all that. You can see it right here on your screen. Wait, my thumb goes this way, right there. And so now that I have this new logo, this is the branding I'm going with. I'm very excited about it. I wanted to to release merchandise, merch, merch, merch. Yes, 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 folks. I'm excited. I've I've launched a merch store. It's happened. It's happened. Tinyhouse.com/slash/merch. It will link you right in there, and I have it at the top of my website. You can go look at it and check it all out. I have a uh, picture to show you. Here's the website, but I'm offering mugs, t-shirts. Got a mouse pad and a hoodie for right now. This is a start, just five items. The store will be, it will evolve and grow. I'm going to have a ton of items. There will be more items than you could possibly imagine in there over time. But to start out, look, think of it as kind of a beta. So it's in beta right now. But uh, everything works fantastic. I've, in fact, ordered a couple sets of all of this to get yesterday. And it will be showing up very soon. And uh, so I can wear it and talk about it and show it and promote it. But this helps me directly. Um, the, uh, the split is pretty good. It's, um, it's fair, you know, from what, uh, uh, what I give back to, uh, a uh, stream elements is the company that I'm doing it through, which they are my streaming provider as well with, uh, when people donate and tip and bits and uh, alerts and all that, all that stuff that goes on, all that interaction, it's through stream elements. And so this is a store that's set up through them as well. So I upload my image, 
they do the rest. They do all the back end stuff, which is really, really nice. That is a lot, that is less cost and less stress on me personally. That's great. And the nice thing about this, because it's so um, basically turnkey, I can come up with a concept for a shirt or logo or something funny and upload it tonight and have a shirt available tonight to go, which is, which is great. No setup costs. Like, and so that means I can offer the price lower for everyone else. It's great. You know, you ever go to these, you ever go to these websites and they offer shirts for like 30 bucks, 35 bucks for a t-shirt and you're like, what the fuck? Hey man, sometimes it just costs a lot of money to make merch, you know? And I get it. And you know, I, I just want to keep the cost as low as I can. So how about that? Really, really cool stuff. But yeah, anyway, go to my website or come out to the Twitch streams because the link is on there too and I'm promoting it and I revealed it live and everyone was there. It was fantastic. God, it was such a funny story too. I'll, maybe I'll tell the story later on. I played Duke Nukem online live. We were streaming and I was just playing Duke and I hopped online. There was somebody in there and they were fucking hacking. Uh, and you guys know I just talked about hacking on the last episode. And I, was, I, went, I was fucking fuming. I was so mad. I went off. It was so funny. Then the dude actually left his game and came and found me on Twitch and came into the chat talking shit to me. Oh, it was, oh, it was fucking crazy. Dude, it was like a family beat down in there, dude. All of the community was like, what the fuck? They was like, bam, 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 dude. It was so funny. So funny. They just fucking. And then all of a sudden, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, boom, he was banned. Like, my community took care of it. My mods, they're on it. <laughs> so good. Anyway, uh, maybe we'll talk about I pretty much just told the story, but. Anyway, there it is. The merch store is live. This is a this is big news. This is big news. Um, so go check it out. Hey, get yourself a coffee mug. Everyone needs a coffee mug. Even if you don't drink coffee, you drink tea, right? Come on, get a coffee mug. Would really appreciate that. How about that? Um, someone broke into Disneyland. What? Jeremiah Smith, a resident of Anaheim in California, was seen jumping over a gate into the back lot of Disneyland California Adventure, according to Anaheim police. Officers were called to the scene and found the man wandering through the park around 11 p.m. at night near the Avengers Campus construction site. They're doing construction out there, working on some things. Well, now's a great time to work on anything. When that's, fuck it. When Disneyland opens up, every ride better be working. That's all I'm saying. Um, the Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout is the name of the ride. Uh, police believe the suspect's motive may have been to steal items or equipment and tools at the construction site. Uh, yeah, so it was the Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. I'm thinking it needs to be renamed. Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Break-In. How about that? <laughs> Stop it. Get some help. <laughs> uh, Pepsi buys Rockstar Energy Drink. It's real, son. It's real. The Federal Trade Commission has paved the way for PepsiCo to buy the drink company Rockstar Energy for $3.85 billion, billion dollars. Rockstar's market share has fallen in recent years, almost 20%, in fact, to less than 10%, which has helped elevate the FTC's concerns of a monopoly. They don't want... They don't want one drink um, supplier or almost a developer producer owning all of the all of the uh, the drinks. I wish they'd have that much gumption and uh, attention to detail with their ISPs. Fucking assholes. Uh, so they they allow the deal. It's happening actually. As I'm reporting on this, is probably going through right now. They said it was going to happen in like a day or two. So it's happening right now. The deal also opens the door for Pepsi to introduce new energy type drinks. Why do you say that is so? Because Rockstar used Pepsi as their distributor. And that was a conflict of interest. So as Pepsi distributing Rockstar, they couldn't create an uh, a energy Rockstar type drink uh, against them, I guess, which is the fine print. So they were unable to develop competing um, competing brands, rather. So, hey, I'm all for it. I think it'd be cool. I mean, this stuff's garbage. You know, it's not good for you. It fucks you over. But, you know, one one every once in a while. Ain't gonna hurt nobody. Mm. Mm -mm. Ain't gonna hurt nobody. Mm -mm 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 -mm. 
How about some gaming news? That was some random shit. Let's talk about some gaming news. Microsoft Flight Sim 2020 has released their hardware requirements. This is exciting because... Okay, I got it all right here for you, baby. Got it all right here. Queued up, ready to go. Let's just take a quick gander at this. Woof. Look at this. Oh, they are using... Mostly, they're using Bing Data and uh, Azure uh, uh, AI to generate um, maps and grass and trees and other data uh, and also community-made stuff. But the game will require... Actually, this is probably... I think this is kind of the first time that we've seen like some real shit going on here. There's some real specs in this. Minimum system requirements. If you're not watching the video feed, I will tell it to you if you're listening to the audio. Uh, minimum specs. Either a Ryzen 3 1200 or Intel i5 4460. Your GPU needs to be a Radeon RX 570 or an NVIDIA GTX 770. That has at least 2 gigabytes of virtual memory on board. You have to have 8 gigabytes of RAM on your system and 150 gigabytes of hard disk space to install it. You need to have 5 megabits per second download internet speed. People are like, 150 gigs? Holy shit. Fucking A, bro. I just downloaded the last update on Call of Duty. It's over 200 gigs that I've downloaded. For that game alone. That is the largest fucking game I've ever downloaded and played. So chill out with that. You're all right. The recommended specs. Okay, so this is recommended. The minimum stuff, basically, you're going to play at 30 frames a second like shit. But the recommended Ryzen 5 1500X or an Intel i5 8400. GPU needs to be a Radeon RX 590 or an NVIDIA GTX 970 with 4 gigabytes of onboard memory on those GPUs. RAM, 16 gigs of RAM. All right. Okay. 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 I mean, you thought eight, eight was like bare minimum, right? Like if you don't have eight, you don't, if you don't have eight, you ain't great. <laughs> Eight's bare minimum, right? 16, they went right for the big, big dog, big hoss, eight gigabytes of RAM. And of course, 150 gigabytes to install it and 20 megabits per second down with your internet speed. And then finally, the ideal, they call it the ideal setup. This is what you're going to want to shoot for if you want to play this game the right way. Here we go. A Ryzen 7 Pro 2700X, which is basically, I think, one step below their top, top of the line model. Intel i7 9800X, which is not their top of the line model. So that's actually kind of interesting. It's not an i9 or anything, but i7 9800X. Uh, GPU got to be a Radeon, uh, Radeon 6, uh, an NVIDIA RTX 2080 with eight gigs of onboard memory on those GPUs. The big whopper, you need to have 32 gigabytes of RAM, baby. There it is. You ever wonder? You ever wonder? That's the game that's going to use it. And of course, 150. And also the bandwidth, 50 meg megabits per second download speed. 50 down. 50 down. Yeah, man. Yeah, they're calling it. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the honesty. I really do. I really do. Um... I'm going to just say this. I want to just put this out there and let everyone know something that I am into this. I'm, I'm going to be into this game. I didn't know about these specs um, until now, of course. It just got released. But I'm going to dive into this game. I want to play this game. I want to get down with it. I think it looks fantastic. I've always wanted to do a flight sim from Microsoft. And I've played like some of the early ones and couldn't really get into it. They're pretty difficult. This one I feel is going to be different. I feel like we're going to have, it's almost going to be like, it's almost like if you create a modern, like first person shooter today, like I don't want to, I don't want to call any games out, so I won't. But if you make a first person shooter or make a, fuck it, just like MMO, make an MMO today. There are elements to those games that you make today that have to dumb down certain things to appeal to the masses. Are you following me? Because if they go for that niche, hardcore, specific gamer, they're not going to sell any copies. Or they will at the first, at the start, and then it's going to drop off. So they have to kind of dumb things down a bit. Not saying that gamers are dumb. I'm just saying they have to make it accessible. 
to new gamers to come in. I would be classified in that in Microsoft Flight Sim as I haven't really played one uh, officially before, like really dove in and, and learned it and mastered it. So yeah, I'm going to be playing it probably with a controller to start. Maybe I'll get some flight controls down the road. But I want to say, if you're interested in this game and or want to watch this game and you don't have a system that's strong enough to uh, play it, either if you're planning to upgrade your system, fantastic. We can probably fly together and play together. But if you're not and you still want to see it, come on by my stream because my system is capable of it actually meets all the system requirements and then some. My processor is higher than the Intel i7. I've got an i9. I'll be able to play this probably. I'm going to test it streaming at 1080p 60. We'll see what happens. I might fry the fucking thing, <laughs> but I will try it and we'll see what happens. But come by my stream if you're interested to watch it because I'll probably day one this. All right. Very, very cool. Yeah, I'm really excited for it. Really excited. Speaking of games, Star Wars Episode One Racer is getting a remaster. Are you out of your fucking mind? I, it's so true, and I'm so happy for it, folks. Remaster of the game will be coming to PS4 and Switch. Hits consoles May 12th. That's that's coming up. A couple weeks. The remaster comes courtesy of developers Aspire, which also were responsible of recent ports of Jedi Academy and Jedi Outcast. And uh, they did that for Switch and PS4 as well. Along with enhanced visuals, Aspire promises via the PlayStation blog that the resolution and FMVs will also be up to modern standards. Control schemes will be remapped to boot. This is great. I absolutely am going to pick this up. What a blast. I really kind of feel like I want to get it on PS4 because I know it will play better. But I think Switch makes more sense. I don't know. Does it have multiplayer? I don't know. Like local, that would be dope. Or even online, fuck, that'd be so great. So great. But I'll definitely be picking that up. That looks pretty good. Um, I, uh, I, got, a, uh, I, con I got contacted by a developer uh, last week. Gen 90 is the developer. They make this little RC racing game called Pocket Cars. And when I heard Pocket Cars, I thought little micro machines. If you, if you think back to, I think they were from the 70s. I think, but it's like Hot Wheels. There's Hot Wheels, there's Matchbox cars, and there was pocket cars. They were a real thing. And if you, if any, I'm, uh, I didn't actually have any pocket cars. I just know about them, but they were kind of designed like the box even has like a, a like a, uh, a Jay Leno fucking a denim like jacket. And you can see like the little car in the pocket, like the picture of it's in the pocket. It's designed to be like, oh, it's my car. It's in my pocket. Pocket cars. Okay, it's clever. But they're actually real cars. And so I was thinking, oh, what's this? But it's not like a Micro Machines type game. It's an RC racing game. More like in the vein of Revolt, which had me excited. And they're like, hey, we know you like, we, we, we see you like racing games. Check out our game. Maybe play it. Maybe review it. Hey, do whatever you want. Just enjoy it. And I'm like, yeah, word up. Let's do it. So they sent me a code. So shout out to them, Gen90. Um, I'm going to be honest with it. And what's nice about it is the game's in early access. This is the best, this is the best kind of fucking game to review is the game in early access. You know, I don't have to be a schmuck like everyone else and just fucking take it, you know, take it to the side of the head and fucking say, oh, it's so amazing, so I keep getting codes. No, fuck that. Give me your game in early access so I can actually be honest with it. You know, it's like, I mean, I'd be honest anyway, but it's probably why I don't, it's probably why I don't get a lot of codes, to be, <laughs> to be honest. I don't play the game like everyone else. I don't do it. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, yeah, I won't go there. I'll have to stop right now. Um, but yeah, super fun. I played it last night. I played it for about an hour and a half on stream. It was great. Um, it's built in Unity. It looks great. It looks like it has um, a lot of potential and a lot of uh, a lot of great fun. Four player local, online's coming. It has a bunch of different maps, uh, like three three maps, but like four different variants of each map. Different courses, different different styles. Very very cool. Um, I'm gonna do a review on my channel and talk about it. And I'm going to give them great feedback. I've already, dude, I already found bugs. I already found issues, collision, clipping issues. Like, dude, I found all kinds of stuff, which is great. Because I, I break games. Every time I play a game, I break it. I'm the glitch master. I break that shit. Shout out to Justin. Him and I, we used to go in and do that shit all the time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Pocket Cars, really fun game. So thank you, Gen90. Appreciate the support. I'll be hitting you up with an email and a review of the game later on. Some Joy-Con colors are going away. Did you guys hear about this? Japanese Nintendo accessories page confirmed this. 
uh, and translated when someone translated it, it says end of production on um, some of these Joy-Con colors. You want to see which ones are going away? I'll show you. Oh, hold on. Make sure my shit's working. These are the ones that are going away. The, I guess that's, I guess it's just the black one or gray, light gray. And then the neon, I want to say it's like neon light green. They probably have specific names for these colors, but I don't know what the names are. And then the, uh, the red one, the red one, can you believe it? The red one? What? The Nintendo color? What? Bruh? Are you serious? For real? Bruh, bruh, bruh. Yeah, I guess that's real. So if you're interested in these, I mean, this was a fucking launch color, right? The gray. What? What? Wasn't it? Or no? Yeah, it was. You get this one or you get the blue and red, right? Anyway, it's, I guess it's going away according to Japanese Nintendo uh, accessories page. So I don't know. There's no there's no word on that uh, in uh, out west if it's going to be discontinued, but it sure is out there. Speaking of Nintendo, let's talk about a few things about Nintendo. So if you log into your animal droppings right now, you're going to find in your mailbox that the old crook himself and Nintendo have teamed up to send you a letter. That is from the Bank of Nook, which informs you that from now on, the interest rate earned on stored bells is going to go down. The letter is apologetic, offering players a gift in exchange for the inconvenience, it says. It's basically a giant bell bag rug, which is kind of cool. It actually looks cool. I do like that. It's basically fuck you, though. It's still, still fuck you. Hey, Tom, I'm Tom Nook. Fuck you. No specific numbers are shared exactly, but basically you're going you're gonna to make less money on your interest with your stored bells now. Why is this happening? Well, basically people are having an advantage in getting money. Websites, there's a lot of different websites out there, keeping databases of turnip prices, people having large communities and friends who communicate and talk to each other about turnip prices to go over, share, buy, sell, do all that sort of thing. Um, and also the dreaded dupe glitch. Cannot cannot confirm nor deny that I did any of that. But there was that duplication glitch before they patched it out, uh, basically in the first week of its launch. So people were duping stuff, getting a bunch of money, breaking the economy, or what they say is breaking the economy. I mean, here's here's my thing. Here's my isn't it the fucking isn't it the point? Isn't that the point to play this game? Not necessarily to, to, to like cheat and, and like break the economy, but like, how are you really, how are you really fucking over yourself? How are you really doing like, I don't know. I don't know. The thing is they offer online for you to go and play with your friends. So you do that. Well, what if my brother has bells that are 400 bucks today and mine are only, or four, turn up prices are 400 bucks and mine are only like 50. And he's like, dude, come over here. You've got to sell your turn ups. There are 400. Okay, cool. I'll do that. Why don't you just not offer them at 400 then? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, yeah, people, people have friends, people have family, people have a community, especially today, how we're all fucking connected through everything. We have a community. Why are you so butthurt and or surprised that we are going to magically go over to some friends' homes and uh, sell our turnips for 400 because it's it's a lot of money over there? Why don't you just get rid of the hot item of the week? How many people have sold hot items of the week? Yeah, we don't. We don't because I don't buy I don't buy 50 uh, fucking stand-up glass mirrors. All right? I don't buy 200 boom boxes and just wait for that one day. We don't do that. We do it with turnips because we're guaranteed something like every week it changes like it makes sense so i don't know i don't know i, th I think this is weird like oh people are actually playing our game and they're selling their turnips for prices that are in different communities and, and they're they're connected to their friends and they're playing like oh this can't be this can't be what are we going to do what are we going to do we must shut it down shut it down we must it's stupid it's stupid what the fuck are you guys talking about we're playing your game. And by the way, we bought your game. So let us fucking play it. Let us do whatever we want. You made those rules to begin with. Is this not, does that not make sense to me? I'll tell you what. I might be slightly, I might be slightly agitated today. For, really for no good reason. Steph told me today, she goes, I think you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And I said, I agree with you. I think that I did. I think that I did. And just, I don't know, just the way I feel today. So I don't know. 
sometimes things that are so weird to me. It doesn't make sense. They're like, we're going to punish players because, because what? Because we're, we're playing your game? Don't be stupid. I'm sure there's like a, a legit logical reason that I probably don't know. But I think, I mean, why would they do that? Somebody, somebody tell me. Please somebody tell me. Death Stranding on PC is going to be delayed. Uh, like many developers and development studios, they're closing down because COVID, they're being safe, they're staying home, they're locked down, they're quarantined. It's going to have a delay on their games. This is no exception. So Death Stranding on PC said it's going to be delayed a month. I say maybe more. Who knows? They haven't said that, but I mean, what's a month? A month just went by. We're still locked down. You know what I mean? Like, give them time. Give them space. It's okay. You'll get, you'll get the game. It'll come out. But it is delayed a month, if you haven't heard. 8-Bit Do Strikes again, but this time with TurboGrafx-16. You know, that company does some really good, good stuff. Great controllers. I really like them, to be honest. They announced a wireless controller for the mini console, the TurboGrafx-16. So if you were lucky enough to get a hold of that console and you're looking for a controller that's pretty much legit, this is a great way to look. Comes in three different color schemes, modeled after the original TurboGrafx-16 controller, and its European and Japanese counterparts, has built-in home button and estimated about 20 hours of battery life. That's plenty. Um, they're available for 25 bucks. Expected to start shipping on May 20th. Got a little time to wait, but, you know, there you go. Um, and lastly, I could have put this in tech news because it's kind of tech-related, but I just wanted to round out gaming news with it. So the Nintendo, here we are again with Nintendo, uh, you guys probably all heard about this, but if you haven't, I'd like to make mention of it. Nintendo accounts have been hacked. A lot, I mean, not all, but a good majority. Well, not a good majority. Just some. Let's just, you know what? This is stupid. Let's just assume all of them so that it's the urgency is there. Everyone should go change their password and enable to to form um, authentication. It's that simple. Multiple Nintendo Switch users have taken to social media. It's a lot right now, actually over the last weekend, and they were reporting unauthorized third-party logins of their Nintendo accounts. The reports have sparked concern over the security of Nintendo's user data handling. Of course, it would be. Some report that their payment details have been used to purchase digital items from Nintendo's eShop. This is interesting. The timeline of this is very interesting. And so Nintendo has recently been running on social media kind of a campaign to promote two-step verification on their Twitter, all right? This was like last week or two weeks ago, all right? A tweet by Nintendo showing how to enable it went live on Twitter about uh, two weeks ago, all right? Before all this announcement, before all these reports that are coming out, all right? Then Nintendo issued, listen to this, Nintendo issued a warning to account holders in Japan two days prior to that tweet. All right. So two days prior, they mentioned, hey, there's something going on. We, what they say? They say, we see um, a lot of inquiries related to credit card fraud increasing. That's what they said. A similar, more transparent warning hasn't been issued to any of us in the West. So we don't know if that has happened to us as well. I can't imagine that things would be separated so much. They're probably all in the same umbrella. So uh, go change your password, enable two-step, two-form factor um, on your account. It uses Google Authenticator, though. So, hey, sorry if you hate Google and don't want them on your phone. It uses the Authenticator. So, yeah, you, you have to choose if you're going to do that or not. Um, I was reading comments about this um, on the articles. It was posted on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else. IGN reported it. A bunch of people reported it. Some gamers said that they even used Google's Generate Password feature to create passwords for their Nintendo accounts. And then you know, if you use Google's password generator, it generates a whole bunch of gibberish bullshit. It generates like exclamation, uppercase X, lowercase B, Y, eight, six, two. Like it is like a fucking 16 digit. It looks like fucking a computer just exploded gibberish in a Google doc. And that's what some people use to create their passwords. And he has said here that even with that, my account had been accessed and my credit card had been used. Whoa, bro. Um, that's a sign of somebody actually having 
not like cracking it, but like looking at the data and having it and then using it. You can't guess that shit. It's so crazy. I mean, you probably could like if you got some sort of hack program or, but I don't know. I don't know how it works, but this seems pretty difficult to guess, I would say. So go to your Nintendo. I did it. I did it just tonight. Go change your password, enable, enable two step and just be secure. Have it ask you to log in with that authenticator. It sucks. You got to use Google Authenticator. That's another. Th There's another thing. Hey, Nintendo, where the fuck are you? You know, you got to use Google Authenticator. Jeez. Don't even have your own shit. Man, why do they keep fucking up? I'm telling you. I hate to say it. And I hate, I hate feeling this way because I love Nintendo. They're. I mean, they're the reason, they're the really the, well, I guess the Atari 2600 is the reason why I'm playing. Well, I guess it's the, the Sears uh, Pong unit is the reason I'm playing games. But Nintendo, truthfully, is really fueled the fire. Let's move right into some tech news. How about that? Uh, CSGO source code evidently has been leaked. Have you guys heard about this? Major source code leak for Valve's biggest competitive PC multiplayer game, Counter-Strike Global Offense. Also Team Fortress 2 which is <laughs> nothing to shake a stick at. That's pretty popular too. It began making the rounds late Tuesday this week, a couple days ago, as of recording this. Um, worries that this code leak for active multiplayer games would lead to hackers finding exploits or building programs to then exploit and hack in the game. Valve released a statement on Wednesday. Uh, here's the quote. We've received the leaked code and believe it is to be a uh, reposting of limited CSGO engine code depot released to partners in late 2017 and originally leaked in 2018. From this review, we have not found any reason for players to be alarmed or avoid the current builds. Uh, as always, playing on the official servers is recommended for greatest security. We will continue to investigate the situation and will update news outlets and players if we find anything to prove otherwise. In the meantime, if anyone has more information about the leak, the Valve security page and the link to it is best to report the information there. So basically they're saying, hey, we don't see any reason that this is going to be a problem because all of our official servers, all of our real shit is something we host and that code isn't in there. But that source code could leak or lead to people making other servers and then hacking in there. Like, yeah, that's real. That's fucking real. Absolutely. It could happen. It could happen for sure. So still just watch your ass. How about that? Watch your ass. <laughs> oh my gosh. We have, we have, some, we have a lot to talk about with this here. I have a two parter here. I have a two part topic, which is related to, Music, streaming, Twitch, performance, what I used to do with my drum covers, my live DJ sets. It relates to all of this. It's a two-parter here. There's a lot of things that are happening right now because of COVID, because we're all indoors and we're out of work. Um, DJs have no job. They're not DJing at clubs. There's, the clubs aren't open. You know, there's and then there's a thousands of different jobs I can I can mention that don't have work. You know, the restaurant industry it's all completely closed for the most part. You know, we're not going in. We're not doing any dining. We're not you know going in in that environment. So, but but specifically talking about musicians and DJs and things like that. So they don't have a gig. So what they're doing is they're like, oh hey, this is a kind of a new brilliant idea. Maybe I should just play my music from home. Maybe I should put up Instagram live. Maybe I should put up Twitch. Maybe I should put up YouTube and just record myself with my shitty ass webcam. Cause I've never done this before. And maybe I should, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should do something. Maybe I should stream. That's really cool. I bet you no one's been doing that yet. Fucking bruh. Bruh. So, so DJs are playing music. They're spinning on Instagram live. Let's talk specifically about Instagram live. Uh, DJ D nice. He did a, Homeschool, very clever, homeschool Instagram live stream, and it went viral. High-profile viewers poured into his live DJ set. Verified accounts like Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama, and even Zach, or Mark Zuckerberg went into his chat to watch. In an interview with Vibe, that's where it came from, Instagram's head of music partnerships, Fadia Kadir, even promoted the use of 
of the live feature during the COVID-19 pandemic, predicting that it would spark amazing creativity during these uncertain times. His fucking words. But DJ D-Nice's uh, lead to stream and do this has led into some problems. Instagram cannot seem to uh, handle that. If you tune into any of these DJs' live streams, you're likely to see disclaimers trying to uh, preempt a copyright takedown, which, if gone through, will stop the stream suddenly. Just stop it. Kick them out. Both streamer and audience, kick them right out to the homepage, and they have to start over again. Sending the streamer then a notice about copyright infringement, forcing them to start their stream over and agree that they won't do that again. And what the DJs are saying is like, it's just totally killing the vibe. Well, I bet. I bet, bro. Inst now, here's this. I mean, here's the, here's the funny thing. Instagram then worked directly with D-Nice and got the stream up and running. And that was all good and dandy. Everything was fine. Oh, oh, they, they just get a, they get a free pass. They can just do whatever they want. And then when Instagram was questioned by D-Nice, and he asked, hey, man, what are the rules here? How am I going to proceed in the future? And they said, while our partnerships with music rights holders allow people to add music to Instagram moments that they share on Facebook and Instagram, music rights are complex and there are layers to the limitation and how you can allow people to include music in their live videos. Oh, complex and multi-layered, you say? Yes, we've been fighting this my whole life. The system is completely broken. And what's very interesting about this is I think I talked, I kind of ranted about this last episode too. I kind of got a little heated. It's, it's like, oh, oh, interesting. Everyone's just flocking to the, the world of music now. Oh, music is popular all of a sudden? You know, not that I've been doing it for a hundred years or anything, but I mean, I've been doing it for a fucking hot minute, you know, and I've dealt with all of this as well. It's been very difficult. And this is why I produce all the music in my YouTube videos. That's my own music. That's why I'm actually planning on doing lots of other stuff with music. Like I'm, I have a lot of plans to release some stuff that's going to help people copyright free. I'm, I'm really, I'm planning on doing stuff like that in the future to help streamers and help content creators and do all that sort of thing. I have plans for that. Because I think it's completely broken and bullshit. If people want to use my music, if people want to listen to my music and enjoy it on Spotify, on YouTube, or wherever, and enjoy it, they shouldn't have a fucking copyright claim on their on their shit that then takes down their video or their stream or any of that. I don't I don't agree with that. I want people to enjoy my music, but then again, I'm not real greedy about about money either. I'm just like whatever. I'm not going to be fucking on this. I'm not going to be the next. Uh, Drake. I don't know. I'm just making up a name. I am not going to be the next this, right? So cool. Whatever. Like I've accepted that. Like, let's just share the love. Let's inspire. Let's create. That's what it's about. I enjoy doing it. But this started out as a, as, as a hobby, as a passion, as just a love, something that I found that I was good at and like to do. I like to drum, make music and produce, touch buttons and play with games and do all this shit, you know? Like, so I'm not at that caliber Right. So that I don't, I don't have the same worries, I guess. Well, no, I do have the same worries, but I don't have the same issues. Right. They're talking about probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars and like ad revenue and copyrights and this and that. So they're all freaking out about it. Well, the system is fucking broken. I agree. I, I agree. I really do agree that the music industry, the music, the, the whole industry is broken. It is outdated. It is behind the times. It is overrun by old greedy people. Um, it's just, it's not forward thinking and it's way behind the times. And, you know, they use scare tactics and do all this bullshit. They're behind, man. They are fucking behind. You know, like when MP3 started coming out in the late nineties, they were freaking out. When Napster hit, oh dude, they were, they were like, we're, we're fucked. No, it's like, get with the times, like figure it out, you know, figure it out. I wish I'd get some special treatment on Twitch and Instagram for any of my music. You know what I mean? Like, no, I wouldn't be able to do that. But, you know, just what it is. So, with that being said, yeah, it's a real problem. And everyone's dealing with it right now. DJs are like, wait a minute, when we, when we spin in the club, like the club has 
they, like the clubs bought the, you know, they have the right permissions. They bought the, the, the rights and they, they paid the royalties and they have licenses to do that. Like they do uh, newsflash. I've been, I've been a DJ for many years and in clubs specifically in Portland. And I'll tell you what, don't tell anyone, but most clubs don't have that license. They don't give a fuck. Why? Cause no one's going to complain about it. No one's going to complain. Why? Cause you want to go to the club. You want to dance. You want to get drunk. You want to find that perfect chick or that perfect dude. Go home with them. That's all it's about. You're not, you're not there to complain. Hmm. Oh, this all 50 cent in the club is playing. And I wonder if they have a license for it. Get the fuck out of the club. You know what I mean? So no one's complaining about that. But typically in high profile stuff and legit run businesses, most of the time they have uh, licenses for that and they're pretty expensive. But that kind of covers it. The blankets, you know, that, that allows them to do it. And I think that's cool. Then everyone gets their money and everything's cool. But it's like, oh man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But then that leads me into this next section, which probably is the best bit of news that I've heard in a long time. I think this is actually awesome. And I, I pray to anything and everything that is that of holy of praying. Does that even make sense? I don't know. That sounded cool. That what I'm about to talk to you about in this article comes true because it will really help musicians. It will really help content creators who do music. It will really help people who perform. And I'm telling you, if this really happens, I'm going to completely change a lot of what I do for my live show and probably bring that shit right back and have a lot of fun doing it. Will Twitch be able to create a real virtual stage for musicians? That's what they're proposing. Listen to this. Twitch today, this was the two days ago I got this article. The company announced it hired Spotify's Tracy Chan as its new head of, produ head of product and engineering for music. Now, Chan worked at Spotify for four years as director of product management. In this role, he was primarily focused on on leading product strategy and development for creator platforms and developing analytic tools for artists and labels, including Spotify for artists and Spotify analytics, two things that I use. I actually do. I can see all my stats. It's great. It's lovely. Um, he joined Spotify April 2016 after the streaming music company bought his photo aggregation startup, uh, Crowd Album. Basically, it's it goes and seeks and finds uh, photos, uh, album art, stuff like that. In order to add to its growing set of marketing tools aimed at artists, he bought, they bought Crowd Album. That was his. So then he joined Spotify, went right over to him. Smart guy. Um, before Crowd Album, though, Chan worked at YouTube as product manager where he launched YouTube Creators Platform in what is now called YouTube Creator Studio. That's what all YouTubers use to see analytics, to see our comments, to see our videos. We get breakdowns of everything. It's, it's so fucking in-depth. There's so much data in there about your YouTube stats. It's crazy. The YouTube creator studio is, is legit. Now, I haven't always been down with all this change and things that YouTube has done over the years. The creator studio, I do like. I do. So I'm like, I'm happy. I'm like, okay, I'm happy. I'm happy with that. That's pretty good. Now at Twitch, Chan joins a growing music team headed by Twitch's head of music, Mark Olson. Going forward, uh, Chan will focus on evolving the Twitch experience specifically for live music and helping artists and fans better connect in real time, Twitch said in an announcement. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is great. Here are some quotes. I want to tell you this. Quote, I've spent my career building career creator tools and I believe there is a massive opportunity to help artists connect with their fans through virtual performances and live streaming, which is what led me to Twitch. Yes. Chan said that. Across the board, and especially at this moment in time, talking about because of COVID, we are seeing disruption in the music industry as artists are having to find new ways to both make money and interact with fans. Yes. As Twitch looks to expand its offerings for music creators... And within the music industry as a whole, I am confident that together with the team, we will be able to build in all the necessary tools to support artists now and as they continue to explore their new virtual stage. He said, whoa, I'll give that a round of applause.
That's huge. Tracy, who is, uh, uh, Tracy went on, who join, uh, Tracy is joining our team at a critical moment as we continue to see growth and growing interest from both new and established musical talent joining Twitch, said Olson. His experience in developing video and music creator tools will be invaluable to our team as we pursue as as we pursue new ways to support artists and connect them to their fans around the world. I definitely should <laughs> not do podcasts in the morning. My mouth doesn't work. Sorry. <laughs> Isn't that cool though? That is like huge news. That just means basically they're creating some sort of music portal, some sort of music element, some like designated music entity, virtual stage to connect real time buzzwords, virtual stage, real time, connect with fans, live performance. These are all exciting buzzwords for me, dude. If they, if Twitch created some sort of live virtual stage for musicians and I have access to that, I can like have a platform that's like legit for the music and I can, I can play, I can drum, I can DJ, I can do stuff, I can create, I can show, I can perform, I can entertain. Bro, sign me the fuck up. I will go out tomorrow and buy another electronic drum set just for the show. And I will set it up and I will start drumming again, dude. Because that is, I love doing that. I love, I love creating and doing that. Holy shit, that'd be amazing. Honestly, it has to be the best news I've heard in a long time. I mean, they really can build something. They really can build something there. I'm, I'm super excited. So we will see where that goes. Um... Yeah, great stuff, man. Great stuff. Really, really exciting. Uh, that's it for tech news. I want to jump into talking about the Game Boy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Game Boy had a birthday. The Game Boy is right here. And I want to show some games. I want to talk about some things, talk about some memories. And then I'm going to jump into the phones because I know Alice called and Alice has a Game Boy specific question. So I'll play that. Um, I'll play, actually, you know what? Let's play that first. Let's go ahead and jump right into the phones. Let's get that going. Because uh, Alice was kind enough to send over the voicemail. Let's go ahead and drop that in. We'll listen to what they have to say about their games and everything like that. And then we will, uh, then we'll jump back here and I'll show some of my stuff here. As always, thank you for the call, Alice. Always appreciate hey, it. Thank you. Alice here. I just wanted to call in and talk about the Game Boy a little bit. Yes. Since it just celebrated its birthday. The Game Boy was the first console I ever had growing up, growing up, and so it means a lot to me. And so I wanted to talk about a few of the games I really like on it. Awesome. So first there's the Puyo Puyo games, Puyo Puyo 1, 2, and Sun. And even though the Puyo Puyo relies on color to tell the different pieces apart, like it's a puzzle game where the blocks are flying like Tetris, but even though it relies on color normally, it still works really well on the black and white Game Boy. They've made it work somehow, and it's really cool. And there's Puyo Puyo Wars, which is um, like Super Robot Wars. So it's a strategy RPG with really great animation. And you it's really have... cool on the Game Boy. Yeah, you have cool and Japanese games I've never heard some of. some <laughs> really good shoot 'em ups like um, the Nemesis games, which are like Gradius. And there's Twin Beta, Parodius Da... And then the, my favorite one, which is Sagaya, which is part of the Darius series. And it's just really cool. That one especially, how they managed to do the music, I will never figure out. Because they nailed the music, even though they had the very limited sound chip. And then there's the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games, which are also really good. Mm. Uh, side-scrolling action games, along with Contra, Bubble Bobble, Rockman World 5. Makaimura Gaiden. Those are all just like really fun side scrolling action games. There's some pretty fun fighting games on the Game Boy, surprisingly. Like Garo Densetsu 2 is pretty good. The King of Fighters 96 is not great, but it's a lot of fun. Hmm. Like the speed of the game is ridiculous and it's King just madness. 96? And Samurai Spirits is not very good, but Samurai Spirits Gunkuro Musouken is a fantastic fighting game on the Game Boy. I don't know how they managed to do it. And then there's a lot of game collections on the Game Boy too. So like there's the Game Boy Gallery games, mm, which yeah, are right. collections of the um, the Game and Watch games, and with. And like, so, like, they took those old games and somehow made them better for the Game Boy and <laughs> put them on several collections. It's like a There's perfect fit for them, you know? The Mobile your fingers. Hero Collection 1 and 2, 
which have all the Game Boy Momo Taro games, which are all just a ton of fun. Highly recommend those. There's the Namco Gallery games, uh, Namco Gallery 1, 2, and 3, which have classic Namco games, and some of which I've never seen on Namco collections. I don't know for sure that they haven't been on any, but I haven't seen them. And then there's the Sailor Moon games, which are a lot of fun. Um, there's Sailor Moon and Sailor Moon R. Sailor Moon R especially is really fun. Steph's going to want those. And then there's Cosmo Tank, made by Atlas, which is like an overhead tank game. And then like you go into Ooh. areas that are first person, if I remember correctly. And oh, it's that sounds really rad. interesting and cool how they did it. Oh, I would love to play that. And there's Bugs Bunny Collection, which is a collection of Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle 1 and 2. Mm-hmm. And I loved those games growing up, and I still love them now. So it's really fun. <laughs> they are fun, simple yeah. puzzle, action puzzle games. I like the one on and NES. Then They're pretty there's fun. There's Bomberman Collection. Mm-hmm, I have that which one. Which has the best Bomberman games on the Game Boy. Yeah, There's they're good. Genjin Collection, which has the GB Genjin games on it, which are a lot of fun. I think that's known as Bonk to people overseas. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, it's the Bonk games, and those are a lot of fun. Bonk? Bubble Bobble works surprisingly well on the Game Boy. Last Bible is really cool. It's a spinoff of the Shin Megami Tensei series. Oh wow, cool! And it's a RP, so it's a RPG. Made by Thought it was Alice a troll game at first. It was a lot of fun, <laughs> like Bible adventures. <laughs> and let's see. Oh, and there's Trip World. Trip World is probably my favorite Game Boy game. It's kind of hard to come by nowadays. I think I don't know. It wasn't too bad when I got it, but um, basically, it's a side-scrolling action game, kind of like the original Kirby, in that it's mm. really cutesy and stuff. But the music is amazing. The gameplay is just spot on, and it's unlike any other game I've played at, on the Game Boy, and I highly recommend it. It's really, really out. fun. And I want to give, I also want to talk about Tasmania. I don't know how many of you may, might have played that out there, but that game is also really, really good. I played it all the time growing up, and I sadly don't have a copy of it anymore right now, so I, that's not included in the picture. But Tasmania also is just a ton of fun. Probably my favorite platformer other than Trip World on the Game Boy. So yeah, those are the games I really like on the system that I recommend checking out if you haven't. And great recommendation. As always, keep up the great work with the podcast. And Thank everyone you. out there, please stay safe. Um, everything's going crazy right now. Hope you're all staying safe and sane. And yeah, take it easy. Thank you, Alice. Wow, what an, this is amazing. See, this is this is why I love having voicemails and talking with the community like amazing stuff. Wow. That's those are better recommendations than what I'm going to get than what I'm going to give you. Amazing stuff. Thank you so much Alice. Appreciate that greatly. I had no idea Turtles was on the Game Boy. You kidding me? I love that game. I'm going to have to check that out. Yes, and you mentioned a few games that I do own that are over there. I, I have about 20 games I left over there because I didn't want to have like a million games here to talk and waste time. But Bomberman, I agree completely. So good. So good. Um, wow, good stuff. Um, I need to know about that tank game. That I forget what, what it was. There's so many so many great games you talked about. The top down and then the first person sort of tank. I got I got is that it's not Battle Tank, is it? I think I have that for Game Boy Color. Battle Tank for I have it for N64 and it's but it's third person. So I don't know. Let me let me know. Like let me know. Also, just to let you know, you sent pictures along with this, and I was gonna show them on screen while you were talking, but um I can't actually do both when your uh, voicemail is playing. Um, but also too, I need permission. You send them in a Google Doc. I need permission to <laughs> I need to request permission to see them. So <laughs> just post them in Discord. Go and post them in Discord. I'd love to see it. We all would love to see the collection. Great, great questions. Great, great recommendations. Thank you, Alice. Appreciate that greatly. Um, our thing was, in 1989, we got the Game Boy. And we got the Game Boy primarily to take in the car with us. We would do, my parents would do something that they would just call drives. So I can go on a drive. And we would just, or an adventure, they'd call it. And we just basically get in the car and we'd cruise out. And we lived in Portland. So we'd go out either to the coast, it's two hours. We'd go up to the mountains, it's an hour and a half away. You know, we would just go out and adventure and explore and have fun for like the day or like the weekend or something. We'd go up to Seattle, 
you know, for the weekend or a day or two and just, just get out. Like my family did that. And I, I love it. I wish, I wish we could still do it. Um, so when we were in the car, we basically, they bought us the Game Boy for that specifically to kind of like take in the car and do that. We didn't really take it to school or anything like that. We kept it at home. We didn't want to break it. Um, but what we did was we got a nice assortment of games, handful of games, but most of the games in this era, we would get on NES. We would play on that specifically at home. Um, but I do have some games that I really like and I want to talk about. First of all, this is the clear Play It Loud series Game Boy. Absolutely love it. It's beautiful um, to see through it. It's gorgeous. This this particular one, I have two Game Boy. I have, I think I have four Game Boys total. These two, unfortunately, missing the clear back, which is very common, you know, as we were kids that we either broke. I think we broke it is what it was. Um, but I'm still looking for if I can find, if anyone has a lead on an official clear back, holler at me. I don't want to get an aftermarket like China Direct one. I know they're out there, but I want to try to get a real official one if possible. Um, so yeah, but very, very cool. We also have the black, kind of the the all black Game Boy. And this one too as well has, I'm missing the the black cover. This is just, I have an extra um, gray OG one that I just have on here for shits and giggles. But it's a beautiful Game Boy. These are great. I love them. And then, right, ooh, hello, Mike. And then right here, this is our original um, Play It Loud Game Boy that uh, my mom bought me. And I remember this very clearly. And she got it at Toys R Us. It's got the Game Boy Play It Loud there, as you can see. This is kind of a clamshell. It's a carry case. I took this in the car to protect it. It's very nice. It holds games with inside uh, dust covers as well. Uh, in fact, look on the back here. I've got the proof of purchase on the back. I don't know if you can read that. Proof of purchase is right there. What's the date? 331.96. This is way late. Way late. How about that? Very, very cool. Absolutely love it. Um, but what's really cool about this is it opens up. Let me, let me put this over put this over here. I mean, you've already see, seen the Play It Loud games, but it holds two games up, up top. And then it holds three games underneath here. Very cool. So we'll talk about, we'll talk about a few games here that I, I really, really love. All I can, all I'm thinking about is that um, freaking Turtles game. Man, I gotta get the Turtles game. Um, Donkey Kong Land. This is, I mean, great, fantastic game. Honestly, surprisingly, it plays very, very much like Donkey Kong Country. I think they did an amazing job with this game. Plays great. The music is fantastic. I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they got that to work, but they did, and it's really, really good. The original Double Dragon. This is actually a really fun game. I don't really care for the... I, I like Double Dragon 2 on NES, but I really do like the original Double Dragon on Game Boy. I think it plays really nice. Uh, it's a great great fighter. Or beat him up, basically. Um, we have... Um, show those last. Oh, yeah. I have Nemesis, too. I didn't bring over. But yeah, why is it called Nemesis? That's really weird. It wasn't called Gradius. Like, it's really weird. But anyway, um, so yeah, here's your Super uh, super Contra, or what they call Operation C. It's Contra. You know, Contra is one of my favorite NES games. So to have it portable on, on the uh, Game Boy was amazing. I played this all the time, and I love it. It's very, very good. Run and gun action. Uh you wouldn't believe it, but uh, Total Carnage, Total Carnage is on the Game Boy. Yes. Did you know that? I had no idea uh, for a long time. But it, this is a Midway arcade game released in the, uh, gosh, early 90s, late 80s. Um, but yeah, this is done by Malibu Games, and uh, it does play like Total Carnage, surprisingly. And it's it's actually pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, Super RC Pro-Am. I have to put this on here. You guys know I'm a huge fan of RC Pro-Am. But to get one on um, on the Game Boy was fantastic. Uh, very good game. 
very good game. Plays plays like the NES original. Uh, you know, I got to talk about the one and only. And although, although I'm happy and that they went for it, and I'm happy that they ported it, Killer Instinct on Game Boy, it's not very good. And how could it be? How could it be? Um, yeah, yeah. How could it be? But still. Really, really cool that we got a port of this on Game Boy. This is something that probably should never exist, right? I mean, taking the hardware to the limits, having to really scale it down quite a bit. The fighting, I mean, the fighting does work. Surprisingly, it does work. It's just not that great. But still, you know, I'm a huge KI fan. Have to have this here, which I do. Um, Super Mario Land 2. Absolute classic. Great, great game right here. It's Mario. It's platforming. It, it takes uh, everything that was good about the first one and tries to do it better. Notice I said tries to do it better because personally, for me, the OG Super Mario Land, the first one, and this this would this either came. Um, there's a hair from 1989 on it right there. This either came with the console. A lot of times it came with it or was sold uh, at launch. So this is so good, it's so so good. The original Super Mario Land, honestly. Probably, do I dare say this is probably one of my favorite, if not the most, my favorite game on the system. It's so good. It really, really is. It's a Mario game no one ever talks about. It's just amazing. And then a couple honorable mentions, of course. We got this We got this with our Game Boy. I think me and about 98% of the population in the West did. Tetris, hello. Yeah, Tetris. The OG Tetris. Classic right there. But Tetris was so popular on the Game Boy. So popular. In fact, there was Tetris DX. Look at this. What? 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 Tetris DX? Yeah. And then wait, what's this? Tetris Blast? What? More Tetris? Is this like a Tetri? Is that is three a Tetri? Does that does that work? Is that okay? It's too early for this. I got too or too late. I can't be saying that. I don't know. I don't get it. Um I'm gonna sneak in a couple of Game Boy colors. I know we should probably do this later, but Mickey's Racing. Shout out to Pete Dore. He gave this to me. I love you, Pete. Thank you. Duke, oop, Duke Nukem. Duke Nukem on Game Boy Color. What? Yes, it exists. And it's fucking awesome. I love it. I love it. And then Rush 2049. What? 2049? Shout out to Brandon. He gave this to me too uh, in Portland in like five, six years ago. 2049 on Game Boy Color. What? It doesn't play like Rush that you know. It plays like a top-down um, like uh, Micro Machines. So it's very different, very interesting, but it sure is fun, done by Midway. Anyway, okay. And then lastly, a couple of, couple of cool things that are there that I really like. I'm a huge fan of flat-shaded polygon racers. You guys know this. Virtual Racing and all these, uh, Stun Runner and all these great games. Well, Race Driving is another game that I absolutely love pretty much in the arcades. It's the only way you can really play this game the right way is in the arcades or on MAME if you can get it running because every port is terrible. Every port is so bad and it sucks and I hate it. It pains me to say it. This is no different. It's not very good. Toy Headquarters, THQ, that's a sign of shit. All right, back in that day, it's a sign of shit. And, you know, it's not very good. But I love it. It's cool to have a cool collectible. Race driving on Game Boy, again, like Killer Instinct, in a way, this really shouldn't even exist. There's no fucking way they're going to make flat-shaded polygons work and run. I mean, it runs at like two frames a second. It's just terrible. It's terrible, but really cool to have. And then finally, before we say goodbye to the Game Boy, I have an official. It's used. We use this to clean it and keep our Game Boys in top shape. This is an official Game Boy cleaning kit that came in this. And this is the original. Let's see if I can open this case here. Come on, baby. What does this say here? Push? Ah, oh, sh push it. Push it real good. Oh my God, am I going to break this fucking thing? It says push. I'm pushing it, bro. I'm pushing it. There we go. There we go, baby. Nice and easy. The Game Boy Cleaner. Look at this thing. Isn't that cool? It's probably out of focus, but very cool. It has this extra long game cartridge, all right, that goes in. All right, it goes in and into the uh, the Game Boy. And then you have this basically kind of like cleaning wand that goes in and then cleans the contacts, all right? You probably can't see it because of the reflection. This actually, see if I can get a, no, there's going to be no way you're going to see that. Damn, no way. 
it actually is branded. It says Nintendo in raised plastic on here. Oh, I'm sorry. There, you can kind of see it. Yeah, it's out of focus, but you saw it. Very, very cool. And I have a set of the uh, of spare cleaners that are not even used in there still. I just, I can't use them. I just can't. I'm just like so excited it's still here. Isn't that cool? But yeah, we use this to keep our Game Boy games running and keep them clean. Very, very cool. You can use the clean contacts in the games is what that's for. Pretty cool. Um, Yeah, so hey. Game Boy, happy birthday. We love you. You've given us many, many hours of entertainment, uh, both in the car and um, at home and everywhere else. Just been, what a, what a great system. This, this is a system that really changed handhelds. I mean, this was groundbreaking. And really, this is what sparked everyone else wanting to make their own handhelds. Very, very, very good. All right, let's jump back into the phones. We got some voicemails to talk, uh, to talk about here. Hey, Jason, Percy Havoc here. So I want to talk, I guess, about video game burnout. Do you ever find yourself tired of playing video games? I don't just mean tired of one game in particular, but just video games in general. Personally, it's been a while since I've really enjoyed playing video games. As I get older, I find I don't have the patience or attention span for games that I did when I was a kid or a teenager. I grew up with long RPGs and the like, but so much of playing games is kind of, I don't know, tedious? It feels like work, you know? Like, I'd rather be learning a new skill than learning a new game. Yeah, I, mean, I just find myself bored, and I can't focus on them for very long anymore. Old games, new games, it doesn't matter. That said, I really love games as an art form. I love the technology, and I especially love video game history, just the subject of video games. But the actual playing of them, I've kind of fallen out of love with. Has that ever happened to you, even temporarily? Anyway, curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Percy, so good to hear from you. Yeah, man, absolutely. I think video game burnout is something that happens to to everyone at some point. Um, whether it's long lasting or not, that's a different story. I think there's there's some sort of phase. I think that everyone goes through. I don't know. I don't know exactly where the age is at, but there's a time where something shifts, something changes to where it's either like if you're a young kid, like coming of age, maybe it's not cool, right? So then you fall out for maybe five, six, whatever the, the, the year is, you know, you fall out for a while. Then you get to a certain age and then you kind of come back to it. You get nostalgic. What happens is you get nostalgic for your childhood memories. You get nostalgic for the things that you liked as a kid. And that's why you see a lot of late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s year olds coming back, collecting, getting games. You'll see the spike. You'll see them at conventions. You'll see like, you know, they, everyone's at different places in their lives, right? Some people, they get out of high school, they go right to college, they go get a job, they become something amazing, and they don't even give, they don't even think twice about their games. Even though they love gaming, they're out of it. They're like, I don't, I don't even think about that. My life is different now. I'm doing something else. And it's not my, I have other passions. Like you said, learning a new skill. Yeah, dude, I think learning a new skill is fantastic. Everyone should be learning new skills. I think that's, that's great, and you should. But also, gaming also is considered to be an outlet, you know, a source of joy, a source of excitement, a source of competitiveness, you know, a source of community. Um, and it is something that brings people together. And um, yeah, I, I think, I think it's a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And not that I'm trying to justify anything here. You asked me a question about if I've experienced it. Yes, absolutely. Because my life being in certain places, I'm doing something like I'm working this job and I'm dedicating myself to this. I haven't ever like never, I haven't fallen out of love of gaming, right? If I had fallen out of love of gaming, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing any of this. I genuinely love gaming. I love playing games. I love talking about games. I love the stories attached to the games. I love being able to pick up RC program, super RC program on Game Boy. And just remember the time I saw Mike Archer, and bought it from him and it then became mine. You know, right? Like we're kids trading Lunchables at the lunch table in junior high, you know, like it's that, it's stuff like that, that really makes me uh, 
tick. If you are finding yourself kind of bored um, or and or don't have the patience and or time, I mean, yes, just walk away from it, man. It's totally cool. Totally cool. I think um, I think it's healthy. It's absolutely healthy. Don't force it. Because I think what might happen, because Percy, I know you're a gamer. You like games. You grew up with games. I think what might happen is down the road, and who knows when that will be, maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe 30 years, you'll come back and you'll be like, you know what? I kind of want to start collecting uh, my uh, Sega Genesis again. You know, I really like Sonic. That was fun. And maybe you'll be in a position at your life where you'll be like, got a bunch of free time. You're chilling. You're doing your thing. You're like, hey, you may get back into it like a lot of other people do. You know what? Or not. And that's totally fine, too. It's totally cool. At least you got to experience what you experienced and you have your memories. How about that? Thank you, Percy. Great, great, great question. I appreciate that so much. Hey, Jason. Chris from BC again here. Hi, Chris. Um, so I just made an album discovery. Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but just so everyone knows, uh, I've been listening to Thundercat specifically his album Drunk oh, yeah. from, I believe, 2017. It's brilliant. I'm completely new to neo-jazz, soul R&B, like oh, jazz dude. fusion. Oh, dude. But I listened to Igor by Tyler, the creator, and fell in love, and there was a bit of Goosebumps. jazz fusion going on in that with some of his rap. And then I listened to this album on my brother's recommendation, and if you haven't heard this album, uh, you need to listen to it because based on your music that you put out, I think you dig this a lot. I think uh, a lot of the gamers out there that are listening to this would dig it a lot. There's samples from Sonic the Hedgehog. He's rapping about, singing about Mortal Kombat, growing up as a nerd. Yeah. Uh, anime. And he, uh, you know, it's a member of Suicidal Tendencies um, that went on solo work under the name Thundercat. And, uh, I mean, Pharrell Williams features on this album. Kendrick Lamar features on this album. Dude. Wiz Khalifa. Michael McDonald. Kenny yeah. Loggins. The Real baby hot. making music. So yes. This is a great album, great for gamers, great for anyone that's into that smooth, kind of relaxing R and D. It's also humorous and really insightful. Um, kind of has this childish Gambino kind of insight humor aspect to it. And it just is so well produced. Again, you probably heard it a million times, but if you haven't, and if the listeners haven't, uh Drunk by Thundercat, cannot recommend that enough. Nine or ten out of ten album. Um, so as I'm getting into this jazz fusion kind of D'Angelo sort of oh realm God. of music and I'm totally new to it, my question for you, what are some albums I should listen to if I'm starting to get into kind of that smooth R&B, R. Kelly kind of world? Mm. Uh, I'd love to know your recommendations. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Damn, Chris. That's my jam. That's my shit. Like R&B, soul, neo-soul, jazz fusion, funk house, dude, smooth jazz, all of that. That's my shit. That, I love it. Absolutely love it. We don't have enough time on this podcast. I could do an entire after party just talking about all of these great artists, all this great music. Dude. I'm down with the thunder, though. Dude, the, the album's brilliant. It is. And, and you have a great recommendation. Everyone should listen to it. Absolutely. Get in there. Take a listen to it. Uh, but, dude, I mean, how much time do you have? I even had to start writing. I had to start jotting down some notes because I didn't want to miss anything. Music Soul Child. M-U-S-I-Q. Go look that. Music Soul Child. Just anything from him. Music Soul Child. Go listen to Little Brother. That's more hip hop shit. That's 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 some hip hop stuff, but also the Foreign Exchange. Listen to that. Uh, listen to the Foreign Exchange. A band, a group of guys came together through online forums, trading beats, trading rhymes. They created their first album through forums. They never even seen each other. Foreign Exchange. Go look them up. Really, really cool stuff. Anthony Hamilton, R and B, extraordinary. Flamingosis. Go look up Flamingosis. There is some awesome kind of retro gamer sort of hip hop, jazz fusion, funky stuff in there. Great guy. Even now, now we're talking about smooth. We want to go into smooth jazz. How much time do you have? You could do huge groove. Awesome stuff. 
Paul Hardcastle. I mean, the list will go on. I, I don't have enough time to, to talk about it all. We could talk about that forever. John B. How about John B.? Dude, put anything on from John B. You want baby making music. That's it. John B. Raphael Sadiq. Hello from Tony, Tony, Tony. Tony, Tony, Tony is great. And I love all their new Jack stuff. But dude, when he went out solo, he branched off. Ooh, good, good stuff. Incredible stuff. He even did a little side project, Lucy Pearl, with uh, what's that chick from In Vogue? Uh, pfft, uh, I forget her name. But she's from In Vogue. Incredible. Uh, Donnell Jones, Maxwell, Mint Condition. Dun dun. Pretty young eyes. Dun dun. Oh, so good. Oh my God. I could do it all day. All day. All day. I love this genre. In fact, I'm heavily inspired by this genre. And like you said it too in my productions and my songs, I write music that's very much in the vein of, of these types of genres kind of all blended together and just whatever comes out, comes out. But I'm heavily inspired by them. I was just talking about, who was I talking about this with? I was talking about it with somebody in uh, chat. No, on Twitch. On uh, Twitch, uh, Twitch last night. We were talking uh, Timothy Games. Timothy... I forget. I think his name is Timothy German Games or German Games something. Tim. I was talking to him about it. And he was just saying that like music today is like so he finds it be kind of like boring and like he loves he loves music that um that has like you know real groove and, and real funk and a real like drive to it. And I was telling him, dude, I love music like that too. Like I love music that actually does something for me. Like when a song plays and a song makes me feel something, when it makes me like do something, like when I when I get goosebumps or when I when I get shivers when I hear it or when I when I hear these the melodies of the chord progression and I just my brain just explodes with nostalgia or my my mind explodes with memories of 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 so many different things of love, of joy, you know, of passion, of all these different emotions. Like when a song does that, there are, there are certain types of people, there are different types of people who listen to music differently and they're all, they're all valid. They're all equal. Some people like to listen to music to just listen to it. It's there. It's, it's noise. Awesome. I call that like a passive listen. It's somebody who just passively listens to music. It's there. It doesn't really do anything for them. And that's totally fine. Some people don't have, they don't have the, the, the buttons or I don't know what happens, but like music to me is something much, much more, whether that's good or bad. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's bad, but uh, it, it does something so much more to me. And then there's people who invest their themselves into the music who actually they will sit and listen to a song and it, it makes them feel a certain something and they, they get triggered in a way they get, they get turned on and triggered and moved and they'll, they'll get emotional. How many people do you know, listen to a song and they'll cry. They'll get emotional. That's the type of person I'm talking about. It does something to them. And then the person who's over there be like, why the fuck are you crying? Listen to this song. Oh my God. That person doesn't have that ability to feel that something. And, um, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. And I cry all the time listening to music. I get emotional all the time and it's just the way it is. I can't help it. I can't help it. I cry in movies. Movies do the same thing to me. I'm at a movie theater, bro. I fucking cry in every Fast and Furious movie. Like it doesn't matter what it is. Even, even not the ones that are supposed to make you cry. Like the ones that are just like action movies, dude, I cry in action movies. Fuck, I get attached to the 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 story and the emotion and the motive and the songs and, and the production and how it comes together and the camera angles, the certain looks, the certain, like the camera angle come around, look at a certain face and then the face goes up and they make eye contact. Like I see that, like that does something, like I visualize that. I'm totally going off on a tangent here, totally going off on a rant. I'm so sorry that I did, but you're talking about music that is so, so important to me. That's that genre, that style, because we've lost that today. We've lost a lot of that today. And it's supposed to be just cookie cutter, make a single, stream it a million times and you're good. But I'd rather make a complete body of music 
for the few small population of people that actually feel something. That's where I'm at. Thank you, Chris. Glad you're feeling better, bud. 503-908-5490. That's the phone number. That is the phone number. 503-908-5490. How do you feel about music? Does it do something to you? Call me. Let me know. Love to talk about it. Love to see how it makes you feel. In fact, because we're talking about music and we're going there, I'm going to go ahead and play one of my songs. I'm going to play an original. Let's do it. I'm going to play it off one of my most recent release. I think that sounds about fitting. I'm going to play a song that is inspired by New Jack Swing, inspired by R&B and soul, inspired by my passion love of synthesizers, of drums, of bass, of rhythm, my love of technology inspiring me to produce and create cool music. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to play something off of my new album, Couple Skate, taking us back to the 90s. You could put this album on at the roller skating rink and it would be lit. It would be completely bananas and bonkers. I'm going to play my second song off this album called Feels Right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. It has been such a blast. After this, I'm going to have a little breakfast, walk around for a second, and then go to sleep. Heinehouse.com. And of course, the patrons. Thank you so much. Brandon, George, Aaron, Weldon, Tammy, Sam, Luke, Ryan, and Justin. I appreciate your support. Patreon.com slash Jason Heine. That's where you go. If you enjoy the show and you're, you're stuck at home, you're just hanging out, and you got yourself a little laugh, a little giggle, a little chuckle, a little tickle, a little tickle in the tummy, you know, maybe consider come on, come, coming on over. Come on over, come on over, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. Much love. Yes, yes, y'all. Jay Hine, y'all. On the beat, y'all. Yes, yes, y'all. One time, y'all. Let's, Let's go. go. It's just what I feel. You break down my wall. Pledged the most on my 2012 campaign Been in the game since wood grain That's a long time like Atari cartridges Love's like heat from AZ streets Drop the top, you're in my passenger seat You got my back like it always has been I can tell by the corners of your eyes You are not a disguise Yeah, I'm trying to get my mind right With all these late nights working overtime when I had that financial assignment You sold off your collection, you put it in consignment Ups and downs, ins and outs And when it comes to you, girl, I never had doubts I don't want this to come off cheeky But I'm like your I.O.V. and you're my little Stevie <laughs> I appreciate the love and wisdom And hopefully someday I can repay Even if you take a second out your day Pick up the phone, let it be known You mean more to me than anything I'll never turn my back and walk, real talk we don't even gotta hit the club tonight. I'd rather stay at home tonight, cause this, this feels right. right. Yeah. Right. It's just what I feel. You break down my wall. And this is the spite. This feels right. This feels right. Just how I feel. You show me love and love is breaking my wall. You break down my wall. You always hold me down, and this is despite. This feels right. This feels right. 
just how I feel. When I feel like I'm worth nothing at all, you show me love and always break down my wall. This feels right. You hold me down, and this is despite the fact that you know I'm crazy, <laughs> but it still feels right. This feels right.